Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. Good morning. I'm really dazzled to see so many people interested in physics at 9.30 in the morning on a Saturday. Let's see if we can turn down some of those. So I'm, my title is a little bit um, counterintuitive. Usually plastics are thought to be something that's destroying the planet. So today I'm going to talk about maybe a different side to them. So what I'm going to spend the first part of my talk about is where we sit in the energy world, um, particularly with renewable energy and what sort of role it can actually play in replacing carbon-based fuels. Um, next, I'm going to talk about solar cells and about plastic solar cells, of which I have no demonstrations up here because you can't buy them. Well, you can, but that's another story. They're not very good yet. And then finally, something that is good is white light based on organic materials. So let me start here. This is a list by Richard Smalley of humanity's top 10 problems. At the very top of the list is, the, is energy. Un underneath it are a whole bunch of other topics, water, food, environment, et cetera. All of those really hinge on our ability to harvest and produce energy and distribute it to people. I always like the, the number nine, democracy appears to be one of humanity's top 10 problems. And if you, it, if you watch Washington these days, you'd understand what he was talking about. <laughs> now, just to give you the first molecule, this is not really a classical organic molecule, but this is Rick Smalley's molecule, it's carbon 60. And what you see are those, those lines or the bonds between the atoms, which are just carbon, and uh, there are 60 carbon atoms and nothing more. This is a very important material for solar energy harvesting. It's also known, if you, if you look at this, um, it's called Buckminster Fullerene. It's also called soccer ballium. <laughs> okay, so now let's think about the world and who we are and our place in it. So this is the world, map of the world scaled to population by country. This is a um, a U of M prof professor, uh, Mark Newman, has an algorithm where he was actually trying to predict red and, and blue states uh, and election trends by mapping the size of counties, et cetera, that were red and blue, and of course we all look purple in the end. But he can do this, he can apply this to any property or any demographic, and here he just shows the world. And you can see, not surprisingly, China and India have the largest populations. The U.S. is about one-sixth of the world's population. Now keep this map in mind. Okay, just get it in your, in your head. And here's scaled by energy consumption by country. <laughs> and the U.S. looks like it, it you know, was inflated a bit. A a Pardon me? It needs a diet, right? Yeah, it could use a diet, I suppose. Um, but you know, there's other countries that are coming up in the world, and that's China. Um, the two biggest carbon producers in the world are the U.S. today and China. Um, but that will soon be followed probably by India and a lot of the countries in South Asia. Notice Japan, too. And Russia is kind of weird. Just, at any rate, you can look at that for a while. And it's kind of fun. Um, so what about this thing about energy? How do we supply it? Why do we need to supply so much of it? And uh, uh, you know, what are the challenges in doing that? So I just put three quotes up there. Thomas Friedman of the New York Times says, what should be the centerpiece of a policy of American renewal is blindingly obvious. Making a quest for energy independence the moonshot of our generation. The Department of Energy is called the current push for solar energy technology the Manhattan Project of our generation. 
And then Stephen Chu, uh, U.S. Energy Secretary, maximizing energy efficiency. And those are the two themes, is producing solar and being efficient with whatever energy we have. Maximizing energy efficiency and decreasing energy use will remain the lowest hanging fruit for the next several decades. It is something that we should do and must do. But there are other reasons to really invest in these new technologies. So a startling statistic, about a third of the people of the planet do not have access to electricity. And the currency of the future is not the dollar, it's not the euro or something else, it's the jewel, the unit of energy. The, it has been clearly shown that the more energy you use, the higher your standard of living. To within, it, it does kind of level off at some point, but it's, it's no question about it. What do these people do who don't have electricity? Basically, they live the same life that they've lived for the last 10,000 years. They go out in the morning when the sun's up, they work in the fields, they come home, have dinner, lights are out, and, uh, and they go to bed, and it's a cycle. Now, of course, a lot of people replace uh, electric light with kerosene light. Kerosene light causes enormous amounts of carbon and particulates in the air. It causes worldwide epidemics of emphysema. You put an LED with a little battery behind it and a solar panel, and you bring light into the home, and you can see exactly what happens. Humans are curious, and that breaks that 10,000-year cycle. So a lot of people talk about the fact that we're running out of oil. We're not running out of oil. We've got as much oil as we're ever realistically going to need because we can get it from coal, we can get it from gas. Um, these, this is the reserves and the resource base. 2,000 years of coal, for example. There's plenty of fossil fuel to go around for us, for the really imaginable future, and the fact that you know, this is probably not even all found yet. We're always finding more. But the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, the reason we need to move away from a fossil fuel economy is twofold. One is clearly national security, or really the security of our standard of living. We're right now buying oil and those sorts of uh, products from places that are not particularly friendly and care about our future. And of course, if we don't get it from them, we will take it from them. If we take it from them, we have wars. Um, the other thing, of course, is the amount of carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. It's changing our planet on a daily basis. So here's a, a Michigan kid. He started in uh, Port Huron, Thomas Edison. That was where his first lab was. And then he moved to Menlo Park, New Jersey. Um, I'm sort of taking a reverse track. I spent uh, about 20 years of my life in New Jersey, and now I'm back here. But in about 30 years before the invention of the solar cell, he said in his nice 19th century twang, I'd put my money on <coughs> the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait till oil and coal run out before we tackle that. In fact, about 30 or 40 years before this, Arrhenius, who's famous for um, describing chemical reactions, predicted that the amount of carbon that was going into the atmosphere from the Industrial Revolution was going to acidify the ocean in about 100 years. Turned out to be right. Solar energy, clean, abundant, and renewable. This is another uh, thing to think about. Uh, how, many here, how many people here know who Willie Sutton is, or was? So he was the bank robber, right? And he said, uh, he was asked, allegedly, I don't know if it's true, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. So <clears throat> why do we go for solar? That's where the energy is. <clears throat> the, on, falling on the surface of the Earth every 20 minutes is enough energy to power all of mankind's needs for a year. So if you made solar cells today, as we make them out of silicon or whatever, and you scatter them in the temperate regions of the Earth, 120 mile wide boxes, um, you would generate enough energy, 20 terawatts, to satisfy all of mankind's needs. That's all it takes. So let's just do our bit. 
the US. But this is the problem, I, I forgot to tell you this. It's clean, abundant, and renewable, but it's also expensive, so I'll get to that point. This is why we don't do it. But let's get to the US. So that's what the solar panel need in the US is to supply all of our needs. And of course, it's over the Dust Bowl, so nobody really cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what if we put all those solar panels around here? We'd have a different feel about it. <clears throat> Actually, it's not entirely crazy. Um, the amount of highway um, paving in the US is about that size. So if you made them all solar panels, which would not be practical, but it just gives you a feeling of the scale of things. Um, it's a big proposition to do this. But we don't have to do 100%. We just have to do a little to really make a difference. <clears throat> so now I'm going to give you the, the real downside of the whole picture. This is where renewable energy fails, its cost. We're fighting a distribution system for fossil fuel <clears throat> and a pricing scheme that has existed now for over 100 years. And so the cost per kilowatt hour <clears throat> of solar is, well, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about uh, five times, uh, three times to five times more. So this is, it's too expensive because people, of course, don't want to have their heating bills to go up by a factor of five or six or whatever it takes. And because of that, this is how much renewable energy, the sum total of renewables, including wind and everything else, and if you notice from the last few graphs, wind is looking pretty good. The things that, that's crushing renewables today, by the way, is the cost of gas. It has absolutely plummeted because they keep finding more and more reserves in North America. But here you can see that renewables are a very small amount. So what is this done economically? So this is going to lead me into why we want to use plastics. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so um, what you see here, the, the problem with, of course, uh, solar energy is that it's policy driven. You know, you need a country to say we need solar to install it in any great volume. And so there's two bars there. I would like you to um, concentrate on the red bar, because that's really where we are. That is the current demand for solar energy in the world. And it's basically driven by cost. And the capacity to manufacture it is the blue line. So if you're thinking about going into business, you'd want to think twice about this one, where we have two to three times more production capacity than we have need. The reason we don't have need is because the price is too high. So the only place that there looks like there's a capacity for large-scale solar is China. They have a command economy, so they command. It will cost this much. That's it. And so people produce into that. <laughs> if you look in the rest of the world, there's absolutely no significant emerging market in the US. You can put it on a few rooftops and so on, but it's not really growing at all. And Europe, which <coughs> Spain and um, Germany were the biggest subsidizers of solar, um, are simply done. The Great Recession has, has really curbed their appetite for installing more solar. So that's tapering off quite rapidly. So how do we close that gap? OK, so now I'm going to just spend two view graphs to give you a little bit of, um, this is Saturday morning physics, so I'm going to ask you to work just a wee bit here. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you some solar cell facts. So the solar power at the Earth's surface on a sunny day is one kilowatt per square meter. Put that in the units that we like. It's one kilowatt per 10 square feet. So you can imagine how many kilowatts are hitting a roof this size here. What we want to talk about is power conversion efficiency, which is how many watts of electrical power can be generated per watt of solar power incident. We know we have available one kilowatt per square centimeter, uh, per square meter. So if you look in the theoretical limit, the, the major solar material today is crystalline silicon and thin film uh, a cadmium telluride, which I'm not going to go into. But the thermodynamic limit, the theoretical limit for efficiency, is only 33%. So at most, you can generate 330 watts per square meter. But we didn't, have never really gotten that far. 
A silicon solar cell, like I said, is most abundant, is about 24%. If you do a whole bunch of really high cost fancy things, you can do a multi-junction solar cell and get to about 42%. But when you finally put it in a module and put it on your roof or put it in a power plant, you're talking about 14%. So for every meter squared, you get 140 watts. Um, very briefly, f uh, power is simply current times voltage and the power conversion efficiency has to do with this current versus voltage curve that I show in the upper right um, where that's what a, a diode characteristic looks like. It intersects the current axis at what's called the short circuit current and uh, hits the uh, open circuit voltage at zero current. And the maximum power, remember the power is the product of those two, is in that purple is in that blue triangle. And just to show you that this isn't all about, this can be real. This actually, this panel here is a nice flexible silicon panel from United Solar, which is right down the street uh, in Auburn, Michigan. And it's nice and flexible and it's, it's lightweight. Of course, you can't really deploy it this way. And uh, so, you know, we'll do that for a long time. And then when the sun goes down, it does that. So we also have to have batteries. Um, this is not the real way that uh, solar cells are deployed today. They're usually on large glass sheets um, and mounted into, uh, mounted into, um, into stands on either roofs, but most likely if you're gonna generate a lot of power into a power plant, which sits in the desert somewhere. Um, so what's, how do we change this? And let me see if I can do this here. You've probably all seen this, right? I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Exactly, how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. There's a great future in plastics. So what are plastics? <laughs> everybody likes that movie. It's sort of famous. In, in my world, everybody plays that thing every day. So <laughs> plastics are, are basically come in three, three types. Monomers, which are what you're seeing there, what these diagrams represent. A monomer is a, is a molecule that has all those open circles there are um, carbons. There might be some oxygens in there. The little, um, you can see from above, that's the same representation. It's got some nitrogen surrounding it. This is an, what's called a porphyrin. And the, and the metal in the, the center gives it its functionality. And you can string these monomers one after another into a continuous chain, as I show up there, and it forms a polymer. And a polymer is, of course, a plastic sheet. And it's very tough. Monomers are not particularly tough. So that's a little bit more complex molecule. And then, of course, there's biological molecules. Bio mole biological molecules are extremely complex. They basically have to be kept in an aqueous solution. That is, they have to be in water. These others would just form sort of classical um, type of devices. Biological molecules are terrific. Um, they make terrific solar cells. It's called photosynthesis, right? And a spinach leaf is one of the most uh, efficient forms of, so of solar energy conversion around. I think it's about 99% efficient for the photons coming in, creating sugar, and doing all that good stuff. Um, we're not interested in those because they're too complicated. Uh, so we're going to really stick with monomers and polymers. So, let me talk a little bit more about organic molecules. They're cheap, which is why we might be able to change the cost curve here a bit. They're easy to process. They're compatible with flexible substrates. So although this is kind of flexible, it's on a stainless steel sheet, it's actually pretty stiff. You can roll this stuff right up. Um, tunable material properties, you can make them any color. So for example, most of you are wearing materials with synthetic dyes. Those are all organic materials, most of them are pretty good semiconductors. I worked for 15 years of my career on a material called PTCDA, and it's the main component of red car paint. So you can imagine how 
and it's a fabulous semiconductor, by the way. Um, you can imagine how cheap this stuff is. It has strong optical absorption, which is important. I want to show you, I don't know if we can get these down lights off, but um, you can see those are vials with organic molecules taken right out of my lab, and they also fluoresce beautifully, so they're going to make good light sources. So it's just a, you know, it's kind of dead, but now I'm putting ultraviolet light on them, and they glow, and you can get every color in the spectrum. So we can put those back on, thanks. And they have a lot of disadvantages. They can be high resistance, so it's like having a battery with a big resistor in front of it, which means it's going to get hot and not do any work. Low stability and reliability, and they have some patterning issues. And the way I like to say it is that all of the disadvantages of organics have been proven beyond a doubt, and none of the advantages have been. So we, that's why we do science, right? I mean, it's the fun part. But all right, so this is the big motivating curve, if you believe it. And there's no reason why you should believe it, because it's never been proven. Um, <laughs> the top, the black line has been proven. So this is the manufacturing cost per watt for the cumulative power production since the invention of the solar cell in 1954. We have. We have of all of the solar cells deployed out there, we have about 14 to 16 gigawatts of power that is being generated by the sun into electricity. So gigawatts, that sounds like a, a big number. It's a billion watts. But let me put this in scale. A coal burning plant is two gigawatts, round numbers. Nuclear plant, about one and a half gigawatts. In China, every, uh, two two gigawatt plants are commissioned every week, coal burners. So you say, well, how are we ever going to catch up with that? Well, we got to get the cost down. Uh, today, the actual installed and operational cost of solar energy is somewhere around uh, 2 to $3 per watt. Most of that has been really pushed down in the last couple of years. So we're still about three times higher than fossil fuel. If you can get this stuff really deployed on plastic, well, you might be able to change that. So the way the whole thing works in a plastic um, material is you don't create, what you need to create is, is an electron and a positive charge with the incident photon. So what you just saw coming in into a molecule is a photon, and that excites a uh, electron from the ground to the excited state, and then there's a molecule next to it, and it migrates. And it just keeps migrating through the crystal until something bad happens, and it just goes back to where it was um, as, a, as a ground state electron. But it's carrying energy across this crystal. I mean, we just keep doing this around and around and around. But what's actually happening is it's moving this energy from light along the crystal. So if only I could find a way to take that electron and separate it from this from this hole that it left behind, which is effectively positively charged, then I got a charge that can go into the circuit. And without going into gross detail on this, I just want to show you how that's done. The light comes in. There's, there's basically two materials, one in blue and one in green. And you have the ground state and the excited state. You form an exciton by light absorption. It migrates now to that boundary between those two materials. Electrons like to go downhill. So when you get to the third quadrant over here, it drops down into this, in this charge transfer reaction. And then you get the free electron in the hole, which is, again, effectively positive charge. They go out into the circuit and do work. The problem with this, if you multiply all those efficiencies, on the downside, it's about 2%. Remember that a silicon solar cell is 24%. So this isn't so good. So how do we manage this? What we do is we have to nanostructure the materials, and I'll just show you a view graph of that in a second. Um, but what you want to do is you want to get your donor, that blue material and that green material, now coming out as yellow, in, in a very large surface area at the nanometer scale um, to interdigitate, like fingers. When a photon comes in, it can absorb along the finger, and then it forms that little exciton, which has a circle around it. Ah. I thought it was going to grow. I was waiting. Um, and they separate. Thank you. 
and the electron gets sucked out there and the hole gets sucked out there. So this is a way to create a large surface area interface and to make um, <coughs> a more efficient solar cell. So this is just an example of how you do that. Um, you figure out how to grow those little fingers at the nanometer scale and then you cover it over with the other material and then you put electrodes on it and you have your solar cell. And this is an example that was done in our lab a couple of year, years ago where we started off with a material that uh, we call copper thalassinine, which is a very lovely blue dye. It actually appears, I believe, in, uh, in uh, ink dot, inkjetted uh, uh, inks. And you can see the little protrusions. Those protrusions are about um, 100 nanometers long by about five nanometers wide. If you go a little crazy in your growth system, they become hairy, which isn't very useful. And then you cover it over. And just to give you an example of how that works, again, it's not 24%. Um, here's a 1% solar cell done the old-fashioned way by just mixing the materials up and heating them and hoping something good comes out of it. But you get a lot of islands and cul-de-sacs for the charge to come out. Here in this controlled uh, bulk heterojunction, you can see that we've got uh, twice as high the efficiency or even more than twice as high. So without going into gory detail about all the various exciting science that you can do to create those bulk heterojunctions at the materials level, this kind of gives you a progress chart for where organics are today. They're sitting at about 6 to 7% efficiency. Now, to make a business out of solar, you don't have to get up to the 24%. Um, a good landing zone is somewhere between 10 and 12%. This is more for silicon. This is being deployed very widely. As a matter of fact, this particular material here is amorphous silicon, or nano, it's called what's called nanocrystalline silicon, and it's basically topped out at about 10%, maybe 11%. So we're climbing up that. We don't know where the ceiling is, but it's probably somewhere around 15 or 20 percent. It's hard to predict. The physics of these materials is very, very uh, deep. It's very rich, which is another way a physicist says, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so <laughs> in this case, it's kind of semi-rich. In crystalline silicon, we know what's going on. So we don't really know how to predict what the ultimate efficiency will be, but it'll probably be pretty high. So there, if we can do this and we can do it cheaply, and I'll show you at the end how we can do it cheaply, we might have a, we might have a shot. So let me talk about the second topic. <clears throat> I think if you've seen, if I've tried to get one message across to you on solar, is it's a very, very heavy lift to change the equation of how we expend energy. It will be there, it will grow, but don't expect it to take, to even hit 10% of our total energy, genera energy generation needs in 20 years. The reason for that is cost, and the reason for that is the size of deployment and the complexity, but the main region, reason is, is that we're in, we are embedded in a fossil fuel economy, and again, two fossil fuel burning plants, kind of the most dirty fossil fuel burning plants, uh, coal, are being commissioned every week in China. And that's just China. So if you want to catch up with that, you have to be generating um, at least four gigawatts a week. Well, we've done 14 gigawatts since 1954. Actually, most of that was, in all fairness, was done in the last two to three years. Um, just a little fact about solar to bring it a little bit home. In the top, I, I talked about where the markets were. The top 10 solar ma panel manufacturers in the world, two are from the US. The biggest solar panel manufacturer in the world is First Solar, which is in Toledo, Ohio. It used to be Toledo, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, so we're bereft at this point because first solar is there. And number eight on the list, I believe, is SunPower in California. All the other eight are Chinese companies. Not surprising because that's where the market is. 
all those eight other companies in the top 10 list didn't exist three years ago. Energy consumption in buildings. So generating energy is tough, but we're going to do it and we're going to get there. But there's a lot of things we can do in the meantime. And the biggie is to work on lighting. So if you look, this is a Department of Energy basically study. Um, lighting is today about 24% of our electricity demand in buildings. And if you think that lighting is very inefficient, it also puts demand on cooling. So we're talking about 30% of all electricity light just use just goes to light up our buildings. So let's break that down a bit. What are our lighting sources? Well, Thomas Edison uh, had the right idea. Uh, he invented incandescent light. They said if you can buy them in the supermarket today, a 100 watt bulb puts out about 1,500 lumens of light, so it's about 15 lumens per watt. That's its efficiency. It's how much light you get per watt of electricity. Kind of the same thing, the opposite thing of a solar cell. Of course, we can do much better than that. We can do fluorescence. Um, these fluorescent bulbs here, for example, are probably running at somewhere around 60 to 80 lumens per watt, but when you put them in the fixtures and do all that other stuff, it's probably about 40 lumens per watt. By the way, these things have been around for 130 years. They, their efficiency isn't going to change. It's done. And they're very inefficient. It's basically a, uh, it's a heating element that gives off light as a byproduct. This gives off light. Now, the next thing that's coming along are inorganic LEDs, and they're looking pretty good. Color is still somewhat to be desired. And they, unfortunately, this, this cost, if you go to, back to your 100-watt bulb, is, let's say, a a buck, it's, a, um, it's about a buck per kilowatt lumen. These are about $100 per kilolumen. So they're very expensive, about 100 times more expensive than incandescents. But we like them here in Ann Arbor. Um, we have LEDs everywhere. This is really the LED center of the universe, well, of America. <laughs> um, we have something like 1,500 LED uh, lamp posts in Ann Arbor. The next largest investment by a city in, uh, in LED lights, I believe, is um, it's in South Carolina. I think it's Charleston. And it has 10. So why do we do this? I mean, it's, I just told you it's r frightfully expensive. Well, actually, it costs a lot to remove a light bulb from a fixture. And you have to do it about every three months. So over the life of these things, it's, it's actually a good value proposition. That's why you see all of the um, signals across the country and actually all over the world now have become uh, uh, LEDs, not incandescents. Because if you have to change it every three months, it just becomes prohibitively expensive. So this is where inorganic arc, and we do this with plastic too. So these are the challenges. It's got to last a long time. It's got to be incredibly efficient, otherwise we're not making any impact on how much energy we're using. Um, it's got to look nice. It can't, you know, you can get, uh, people complain about a lot of fluorescence. Uh, the first thing you should look for is what's called the CRI on the side of the bulb. That's the color rendering index. It should be over 80 to be good light. If it's not, you put it in your garage. Um, <laughs> and uh, it has to be pretty high surface luminance. A display, just to give you an idea, is about 100 candelas per meter squared when it's fully white. So it needs to be about 20 times brighter than a display. So in 1987, two guys from uh, Kodak came up with a nifty little device called an organic light emitting device, an OLED. And in this case, um, the you just take, again, just this is 500 angstrom, so that's 50 nanometers. About 100 nanometers of material, you put a green emitting material here and a transparent material here. You put it on glass with indium tin oxide, um, which is a transparent conductor. You put an electrode on top. You put electrons through. It's exactly the inverse process that I showed you before. Rather than a photon coming in and generating an excited state, in this case, you put in an, an electron to create that excited state, and you wait for that excited state to collapse, and it form, and it puts out a photon. This is the spectrum from this thing. It basically says it's green light. This, unfortunately, is pretty inefficient. 
So we looked at this problem a bit, and we did a little quantum mechanics. So this is the second place I'm going to make you work a little bit. Um, the problem with that particular device is that it um, takes only, well, I'll, I'll do it from this view graph. I think it's a better way to do it. So you inject an electron from one electrode, you inject this hole, this positive particle from the other electrode, and they have spins, quantum mechanical spins. Um, they can have a spin up or a spin down, and we like to denote those by an arrow, so I just use my finger. So if you randomly think about it, you have one state that will have a spin up, spin down. I'm going to really confuse you with this. So the electron in the hole, spin up, spin down. It's actually two electrons, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I could also have them spin up, spin up, because it's random. They could be spin down, spin down. And they could also be spin up, spin down, but with a positive sign between them, and it goes on and on. But the fact of the matter is, is that three quarters of the uh, injected electrons of that last device are wasted because they go into what's called this uh, spin symmetric state, like the spin up, spin up, or the spin down, spin down. And those do not luminesce. They actually give off something called phosphorescence. We know it. It's on our watch dials and so on. It takes forever, and it's very inefficient. The devices of Ting just took the spin up, spin down combination, and that is very fast, and it gives rise to fluorescence. But we're still throwing away all this energy. So what we did is we used molecules that were luminescent that had a heavy metal atom in the center. So it's all carbons and hydrogens and that sort of stuff around it. But in the center is a heavy metal. And that heavy metal changes all these spin symmetric states to spin anti-symmetric states. And they relax very quickly. So we get 100% of the light out. And when we do that, we get all the colors of the rainbow just by changing subtle things about the molecules. So this is what's called the chromaticity diagram. It's a way that scientists have of quantifying your vision. You can mix various colors, and you see something else by eye. And these are actually the emission patterns of OLEDs um, that are phosphorescent, all about 100% efficient uh, all across the spectrum. And if you want to make white, we all know that you mix red, green, and blue, and you get your whites. And these are just examples of white OLEDs. And I'll show you some really lovely pictures of that. So what can we do with OLEDs? Well, we can make white light. But we can also make, well, let's see if I can get this thing to work. We can also make displays. I've actually got a display up here, which is an OLED TV um, from Sony. And you can see it after this um, lecture. But it's really beautiful. It also will cost you $2,500. Um, so it's, oh, this is, by the way, this is the solar car video, so I'll mute it. It's a great story, but uh, you can, I just see if I can just show you. You can see the kind of, oh, by the way, look at how narrow it is. It's like three millimeters thick. Everybody wants one, let's face it. I couldn't afford it, but I have a really good friend, and one day I come into my office here and in Fleming Hall, and there it was sitting in a box. My wife will not let me take this to the lab and set it up there because she likes it too much. <laughs> um, so but, so it's, it's narrow, it's three millimeters thick. You can put it on plastic so it can roll out like that display. And then here's a, that's a very early flexible display. Now they're full color. And that's a craft advertisement by the company who did that. Um, and you can see that these things are really beautiful. And they're now appearing. These things are, will be, they're coming out in the Google phone and the Microsoft phone. And they're scheduled to come out, I believe, in the uh, iPhone uh, fairly soon. When you see them, you fall in love with them. It's you know something about looking at pretty things. Um, it's like candy. Uh, so we can also, of course, make, uh, uh, make white light. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is where we are in the white light business. It's looking really good. The DOE target for uh, 2015 is to have 150 lumens per watt. Remember that what I showed you before uh, was a 
uh, incandescence at 15 lumens per watt. This is 10 times more efficient. 10 times more efficient for something that is occupying around 30% of our electricity demand has a huge effect on the number, uh, on the amount of energy that we need and therefore need to deploy. And this is just where we are now at about 100 lumens per watt. It looks pretty good. Um, and it's moving very, very fast. I would predict that probably within the next year we'll be pretty close to hitting the DOE target. And this uses this process of phosphorescence or electrophosphorescence as we call it and getting all the light out of the glass, and there's a lot of engineering pieces to it. But it's really, uh, it's really quite an attractive technology, as you can see here. This is the lighting panels of the future. Um, you might notice that these are all done in the, uh, in the dark, but they're actually quite bright. And you can buy, uh, you can buy some very expensive specialty fixtures today with it. There's still an issue with lifetime, um, Lasts, the, the blue component of this light lasts probably on the order of uh, uh, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is a year of continuous use, but we'd like it to be 20,000 hours. If it differentially ages, that is the blue decays faster than the green component in these devices, it'll start to look a little greenish with time and you don't want to have that. So the future, what does it look like? And then I'll finish up here. Um, what the idea is, is to use this platform of organic materials, thin, flexible, on plastic sheets, on metal foils or whatever, and create electronics like we create newsprint on printing presses. Doing it quickly, um, doing it extremely cheaply. I don't know how much a, a page of newsprint costs, but it's significantly less than a, a penny. So we can do this. Um, Eventually, we can't do it now. There's a lot of people who are playing around with this. This just shows some circuitry um, done by uh, Penn State. I showed you this very early. That was about a 10-year-old, by the way, flexible display uh, using organics. And if we can do that, then we can make solar panels at large scale and extremely inexpensive, and we can actually pound down the price of this expensive lighting. So this is where I want to end up. Um, you know, if you, if you think about what I said over the last 40 or some odd minutes, um, it would seem like the sky is falling. We'll never catch up with coal. There's an infinite amount of coal. We're stuck. We're, we're addicted to this stuff. Um, yes, that's true. But there are also numerous solutions to this. And I've shown you one class of solutions, clearly uh, conventional semiconductors and a whole bunch of other technologies will also play a role. The climate change and energy security make our search for solutions imperative. It is simply not an option anymore. I think we've certainly learned that in the last decade, what the real cost of oil is. Organics will play a role. The lighting sources are already finding small markets. Clearly, it's being led by, by displays, but that's just the leading edge of it. Organic photovoltaics have much further to go. But there is good potential, so we have to work out a lot of these physics problems. This has been, you know, I haven't shown you a whole lot of physics today, but I wanted to give you a sense of the type of things we're doing. We're doing things at the nanoscale. We are manipulating materials' properties right from their composition to how we put them down. But no matter what technology we choose, policy, behavior, and vested interests are the real showstoppers. Behavior, why do we drive Hummers rather than Priuses? Why don't we use um, miniature fluorescence when they cost less than incandescence? Is, are we really upset because there's a tenth of a second delay between the time you turn on the switch and you see the light? Um, I have a house in, uh, in Vermont which is completely off-grid, so I have to supply my energy with solar, and I have a backup generator because it snows in Vermont, and sometimes we get seven feet, and my panels sit on the roof, and one of the locals there said, I put them on the roof to get them closer to the sun. Um, <laughs> I, I made every mistake in the books, but in that house, just an average sort of house, about 2,000 square feet, I took out every incandescent bulb because I wanted to be careful with it, with my energy use, 
and I put in miniature fluorescence. Um, I took out about 150 light bulbs. Look around your house. Figure out how much money you are spending every month. If you turned on every light bulb and just left it on um, in your house, which is not advisable, but um, in an average American house, that's about $350 of electricity bill per month. So you can really change that, and that's the low-hanging fruit. And then, of course, we have vested interests. We have a display, uh, a distribution system for energy today that simply is not going to walk away from the table. There's a lot of money in that business, and it will continue to be there. So how do you bring in a new technology that will slowly eat away at its base? But with that, I think there's a, lot of, uh, a, a great deal of hope, and um, I think that physics plays a very major role in solving these problems. Before I uh, close, I wanted to introduce my, uh, my trusty assistant who put together all of these, uh, Celia Cunningham, who's a physics grad student. And uh, she, she actually works on these things. I think solar energy, as I recall last. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.